Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome back to Starbase Texas. This is, of course, where SpaceX is building their Starship vehicles. This is part one of two parts. In part one, we're gonna take you around the factory, see what's new, see the ships, see the boosters, see Star Factory from the inside for the first time, and just learn a lot along the way. So stay tuned for part two, where we'll take you out to the launch pad, and we'll also follow up with Elon after the launch and see how it went. So without further ado, Let's go on another tour with Elon Musk. Cool. Um, so, yeah, as we were saying, I mean, obviously a, a, yeah. a lot has changed in the last couple of years. I mean, this it is has? all. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in theory. I don't know. I mean. Looks exactly the same. It hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> what once was tense is now a permanent looking factory. Yeah. It used to be intense and tense. <laughs> and now it's uh, in a building. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got this, um, I think, pretty good looking rocket factory building that we've uh, almost completed. Uh, we've completed the exterior. Um, this, is, this will enable uh, us to have serialized production of mm -hmm. the rocket, especially the ship, which will ultimately be made, you know, long term, probably be making a thousand a year of the ship. So, a thousand a year. Yeah, well, you know, you gotta build a city on Mars. <laughs> yeah, that's insane to think about. Yeah, I, don't know, I mean, we may not build a thousand a year right here, but I think this is, this is capable of a hundred a year. Really? Sure. Wow. That's only a ship every three days. And that's nothing. And I was, <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's funny because now, you know, if you think about it, even uh, Falcon 9 these days, you're producing a second stage about every two days. And yeah. a few years ago, that would have been impossible. You know, no one yeah. would have imagined, yeah, that they're building an upper stage. This year we'll make almost 200 uh, upper stages of Falcon. That's and, unbelievable. Um, next year, probably over 200. That's, you know, so. <laughs> That's a cadence that people I don't think are, you know, just even, you can't even imagine. You can't even fathom that kind of, you know, yeah. output like that. That's just crazy. Well, Falcon crazy. 9 is, is actually a heavy lift vehicle. So, um, you know, it's, um, there's roughly 40,000 pounds to orbit. Yeah. Um, so, which is uh, in the normal rocket language would be a heavy lift. Yeah. So, uh, now Starship's going to be able to do 100 tons to orbit with Starship 2, maybe a little more than that, mm -hmm. uh, with Starship 3, like at the nine meter diameter, essentially when the nine meter diameter is sort of fully stretched out to what ends up being from 120 meters total length to probably 140 or something like that, um, <laughs> uh, then um, it's lot, this is like a lot of optimizations and improvement, yeah. engine improvements, heat shield mass improvements, um, reducing the amount of propellant needed for landing. Um, kind of basically do all the things that we've somewhat done with uh, Falcon 9 mm -hmm. and you get to uh, a pretty efficient vehicle. I think we'll be able to do over 200 tons to a useful orbit uh, with Starship. That's insane. So, and that's with full reusability. That's with full reusability. Which is yeah. insane. So that's twice the Saturn V with full reusability. <laughs> um, and full and rapid reusability. So it's yeah. the booster and the ship are coming back to the launch site. Right. Should we, uh, should um, we take a look yeah. at, at what's uh, going on in there? So, <laughs> uh, so as far as, you know, we're seeing all this, you know, you're talking about even version one, maybe be able to do less than 100. But is, is version one really even going to... I feel like version one in my yeah, head version is just one a, is, a, is just to the, the point of and, and we're really kind of starship we're version 1.67 i don't know right it's like yeah. we're, we're like many iterations through on on version one yeah um so and it's just like a it's just a canvas it's like a it's a test experiment still at this phase it's just a, yeah I, uh, I don't think people they see it and they don't understand that like this is all just still a giant test at this stage yeah, one way to look at technology is to look at it as um, like you're, you're rendering an image in successive levels of detail. So the first layer of the image is very, very blurry and things are out of place. And then with the, with the next pass, it, it gets a bit more defined mm -hmm. and things kind of shift into place. And you do another pass and another pass. And eventually uh, it's something that is refined and, and, and actually works. Yeah. Right. But we're, we're in uncharted territory with, uh, with, with Starship. So there's not like... Yeah. Uh, Nobody's ever made a fully reusable orbital rocket. Right. And th that's, that's really the, the critical breakthrough necessary for life to become multiplanetary. Mm -hmm. For us to become a true space-faring civilization, we have to achieve full and rapid reusability. Yeah. So I call it rapidly reusable, reliable rockets. <laughs> R, R, R squared. Or R 
R R R R R yeah yeah pirate <laughs> space pirates there we go <laughs> yeah. so um, and it's the thing is the people need to remember is getting achieving orbit's been solved I mean you guys have been <laughs> yeah. getting to orbit for a long time it, reusing it, the, it getting, and, I mean getting to orbit at all was solved in the, in the 50s right I mean, for you know so so I mean I really don't think there's another point in, point in another in exp, an expendable rocket right. in my opinion um, so. Or at least I think the math clearly demonstrates that it is there is no point in a in an expandable rocket. You have to achieve re reusability. Re we have reusability in uh, cars. We have it in airplanes. We have it in bicycles, horses. Yeah. Uh, it's bizarre to not have reusability in any other form of transport. Boats. Um, <laughs> yeah. It would be insane to like chuck a boat away after every trip. <laughs> right. But this is how rockets have worked for the vast majority of time. In fact, SpaceX is still the only rocket that ha that is uh, has any reusability with Falcon right. 9. Right. Um, so with Falcon 9, we, we, we bring the roosters back, we, we refly them frequently, we bring the fairings back, we refly those. It's only the upper stage that is um, expended. Right. Um, now, it does, Falcon 9 does not qualify as rapidly reusable right. uh, because uh, the, the, most of the time the booster is landing um, on a ship in the ocean. <laughs> right. So it um, takes a few days to get it back. Yeah. Oh, that's speeding up like crazy. I mean, the cadence out of the Cape is... Unbelievable. Yeah, we're it's, trying to squeeze every like quarter of a knot that we can out of the, the drone ships. Yeah, so, it seems that way. Yeah, we're, we're jacking up the power on the ships, um, streamlining, <laughs> streamlining them, increasing the power on the, the tugging vessels so we can just haul ass <laughs> as quickly as possible. Well, yeah, I think you just had your fastest uh, turnaround just last week. There was, a, I mean, it was something like, I don't remember the time, but it was something like two days or something from, yeah. from catching back and then out to catch again, which just on you know insane it used to take so much longer and yeah those are the, all those little things that people just aren't necessarily paying attention to that are continually improving and yeah no, it's it, the, the spacex crazy. falcon team is doing an incredible job of achieving uh fast turnaround reusability um given the architecture yeah um now uh that's that's still however um a couple days to get a boost back and then you know at least a few days to refurbish it for flight Mm -hmm. is still uh, not rapid by aircraft or, you know, vehicle, you know, in, in, like if you take cars, boats, planes. Right. Um, you know, having, doing a trip every four days is not, would not <laughs> right. cut it in a car. Right. Uh, right. Or an aircraft. Right. Um, so uh, with, uh, with Starship, the booster comes back to the launch site, is caught by, caught by the arms, or, mm -hmm. you know, this would be quite spectacular yeah. to see. Uh, giant Mechazilla arms catching a rocket in midair. Yeah. And, um, and then... Those, those arms put it back on the launch site. So you can have the booster uh, back on the launch mount um, in, well, it's gonna, come, it's gonna come back and land in like five or six minutes. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> so then you can probably get it back on the launch site in, well, if you really push it, you can probably put, get it back on the launch site in 10 minutes. Right. Um, or even five minutes. And then um, you can fill it up in half an hour. So you, you could be ready to go an hour later from the booster standpoint. And then if you've got ships lined up, you can drop another ship on, uh, you know, um, fill it with propellant. Mm -hmm. And uh, in theory, you could be launching every couple of hours. Yeah. Um, it's hard to imagine now, but it was hard to imagine where Falcon 9 is today, you know, yeah. 10 years ago. No one would have imagined what Falcon 9 is doing now. So I, I think... Uh, Time will tell yeah. that, you know, you can just keep chipping away at all those little improvements. And so do you think you'll actually yeah. fly? Falcon 9 used to be have re reusability measured in, in months, then weeks, uh, then days. And then for, but for Falcon 9, the arch architecture is limited to, you really can't compress it uh, down less than several days. Right. Um, when you take the landing out to sea and then the necessary refurbishment of the booster yeah. that is required. Um, so with, with, with Starship, we'll take it from days to uh, two hours. Wow. Um, Do you and, think? Um, yeah. And then, yeah. So then the, the ship has to go around the Earth. And, and depending upon what orbit it has, it's got to have a ground track that comes back over the launch site. Right. So that could take several orbits. So it, it, the, the ship could take, uh, you know, several hours, sometimes half a day or something like that to come to back. To reline, yeah. Yeah. So you'd, you'd want to have a lot more ships than boosters. Yeah. So if you're really going for max launch rate, you probably want uh, roughly, I don't know, five ships to for every booster. Every booster. Yeah. And that's what you guys are building uh, a pretty massive cadence here of of ships and boosters already. Yeah. Now, do you think? Well, I mean, 
yeah, it's it's pretty slow compared to what it will be, like very slow. Um, but we're also iterating the design, so it, like each one is a little different from, in some cases, a lot different from the last one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Are any of these uh, what are any of these going to be the V2 yet? Are we starting to get close to some V2 hardware yet? Or um, yeah, um, this, this, the stretch version is uh, basically V2. Um, well, I guess it depends on whether we call it V2 or don't call it V2. The slightly stretched version is V2, ugly. Um, so, yeah. Um, that, so you can see, you know, what we have here is a Starship with, I've uh, seen the heat, the heat shield side and the non-heat shield side. Yep. Um, it's got the, uh, what we call the PES dispenser for um, tossing out the next generation Starlink satellites, the, the V3 satellites. So those will be very wide diameter, like, like sort of, I don't know, seven meter diameter sat satellites. Yeah. So, 20, you know, 22 feet or something like that. Right. Um, so, so are these actually going to be like, are we hoping to see after, let's say this test goes well tomorrow, do you think the next one's actually going to go for orbit and start deploying tests, like testing out, trying to deploy Starlink? Or are we, where do you think we're in in that whole mix? Like, is that maybe a few more down the road to start actually deploying payloads into orbit? We'll see how this mission goes. Um, I mean, this this year is not not about delivering satellites for Starship. It's all about ironing out the the, the design question marks. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, the major things that remain to be solved for Starship, um, uh, the biggest the, the the single biggest one is uh, what does it take to um, get through the high heating of reentry. Mm -hmm. So you can see the, the heat shield that we have there. Um, we have some, uh, uns well, let's say like uh, uns unsolved questions yeah. on the heat shield. Uh, yeah. A bunch of which we don't even know that they are questions. <laughs> um, and, uh, and and some we're aware of because there have been challenges in the past, like with Space Shuttle. Um, yeah. the, the, the sort of the hinge area and the hinge gap yeah. um, and sealing that hinge gap and not having a hot gas just um, go flowing super fast through through the, the interface there. Yeah, through well at, at, at where, where the flap hinge is. Yep. Because um, if 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 you get hot gas flowing through rapidly, that that'll cook anything yeah. during the tile. So, so you've got, you've got a block. We've got a, a hot gas seal um, at the the forward and rear flap hinge. And um, so you know one of the key questions is does that seal work? Right. Uh, we think it'll work, but it may not work. Um, then there are some, you know, uh, questions of like how well do the tiles stay on? Right. Um, there's a there's a fundamental challenge here where the tiles are um, ceramic, so they're very brittle. They're like a like a coffee cup, right? Uh, or a dinner plate. Yeah. Um, so you've got uh, essentially a whole bunch of dinner plates uh, stuck to a steel surface. The steel surface is um, getting cryogenically cold uh, because of the propellants, so it's shrinking. Yeah. Um, so on ascent, the, the rocket is shr has uh, shrunk. Yeah. Uh, so you, got, you can't have the gaps in the tiles be too tight mm -hmm. or they will just shatter against yeah. each other. Yeah. The gap will be too tight. Yep. Um, then when it's coming in for landing, the, the shuttle, the, the, you no longer have the cryogenic propellant in the main tanks mm -hmm. and the shuttles get, the tiles get very hot. Yep. So now they, they want to expand. Yeah. So you've got a contracted inner surface uh, and expanding tiles. Oh, geez. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> now, and, and the thing is, like, you can't you can't have a big tile gap because then the plasma will get in there and melt the primary structure behind exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. So like, what's the what's the right tile gap? Um, and that's going to vary depending upon where you are um, on, on the rocket, on the yeah. ship, you know, so yeah. it's, it's going to be like some parts of the ship have cryogenic propellants, some don't. Yeah. Um, there's also the, how well do the tiles attach? Uh, if we attach them and they, uh, and we accidentally break one, but it's hard to see, then that, that could be an issue. Right. Um, 
and we currently think we're we're probably not resilient uh, to failure of a to loss of a tile mm -hmm. in um, the hot sections of the of the ship that are um, <clears throat> the the tank portion. So that the, the so if if um, the, the pressurized the, areas. Yeah, the pressurized areas yeah. exactly. So. Yeah. And, and so technically, the, the nose will be pressurized too. So if the, if the pressurized areas um, lose a tile and then you melt that area, th it, that'll cause it to pop. Right, right. So the ship will explode. Yeah. Um, so now people have asked, like, why are there some missing tiles in the rear of the well, ship? Well, like right now, uh, Flight 4, you got, yeah. I think, three tiles missing right now. Yeah. Yeah. So those are in the rear of the, uh, of the ship, which is the an unpressurized part, right? region. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an unpressurized re region where we think we can uh, see, w w well, you can, you can have a melt through of the unpressurized region and it will not cause failure of the, the vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Like you might have a little hole there or something. Right. Um, but uh, it's not gonna pop the vehicle. Right, so that's, you're literally doing it as like an A-B test almost of like, yeah, we what see, happens if we're yeah, missing Yeah, what happens a tile? if we lose a tile? Um, huh. Now, well, we, we do have plans for uh, a secondary shield uh, beneath the tiles that is uh, much better than what we have right now. So like right now we, um, and some of this, I can't say the details of it because it's like ITAR control is sort of right. secret. Um, but the current material we use, we think is not resilient uh, to a tile failure. We have um, a new design that we think is resilient to a tile failure. So behind the underlying structure. Yeah, and essentially like it's got ablative so if you do, if you lose the tile, mm, you have to replace that the ablate the ablative. Right, right, right. So you you you'd have to you'd you'd, uh, you'd lose out on reusability because of the lost tile and right. the and the ablative. But you have a. But at least it's intact. Yeah. And you um, recover it, re refurbish it, yeah. and get it back out on the yeah. on the fleet. That's and, cool. And especially for carrying people, uh, which ultimately we you know expect Starship to carry it um, maybe a hundred people at a time to Mars. Right. Uh, and also to the moon. Yeah. Then, um, you know, it's got to be super reliable. It's got to have um, no, no, ideally, no single point of failure. Right. So, have you given up I, a long time ago? You're talking about transpirational cooling or active yeah. regen and stuff. Did that just kind of didn't make the trade, or? Um. The mass trade that we did. I think it's this point, like it's four years ago or something like that, yeah. maybe five. Um, it, it seemed like at that time it would be at least twice as heavy as a, um, a ceramic, ceramic heat shield. shield. Um, now, since then, uh, the weight of our ceramic heat shield has grown. And yeah. then when you factor in the, the secondary shield, that's additional mass. Right. So I don't know, it, it may not be that big of a difference between um, actively cooling a heat shield mm -hmm. and uh, and having ceramic tiles. Um, have you seen what, yeah. what Stoke Space out in Washington is working on where they have a, it's of course, a, Aerospike's gonna come out of my mouth because for some reason Aerospike comes out every time I talk about anything, but it's a Aerospike, but the base plug is actually the active regen uh, heat shield. And so as it, and it's expander cycle, so as it comes back through the atmosphere, it's actually, you know, heat, they're using uh, hydrogen to, uh, to actively regenerate, you know, and cool the heat shield and just gets dumped out the, the nozzles basically as it's, you know, as it's uh, going. And that actually also gets, uh, some of the gas gets vented out through the middle. So you also have like a, a boundary layer there too of, of gaseous helium or hydrogen in the, in the front and it's being actively regen. I think it's, it's a really cool, cool concept. And I was really impressed. Uh, it's a, it's, it made me just think about like regen, you know, active regen in a different way. And I thought that was pretty neat, but I know you guys had talked about the transpirational cooling years ago. So it's, I didn't know if, um, yeah. I think it's probably correct that, uh, that, that a ceramic heat shield is going to do better than transpiration. There's also the question of like, if, if once, if you go to Mars and you're coming in at, at hot and you're coming, or you can, and you're coming back to earth, you're coming in. If you come back from, from Mars to Earth, mm. you're coming in very hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not clear whether transpiration cooling could succeed could there. Up there. Yeah. Um, uh, here's my wacky, dumb idea of the day is uh, on the inside of the tank, if you had like a thermal camera, you have like a fire hose, 
with cryogenic coolant. Just spray if there's a hot a burn through. Sure. Spray it down from the inside. I don't know. I'll just I'll always be happy to yeah. throw out the dumb the dumb ideas. <laughs> Especially when you have header tanks there, you know, that are filled with with the cryo all pressurized, ready to go. You know, all it's gonna take is one one heat shield tile missing potentially, and could have a yeah a bad day. You know. There's a lot of ways to solve the problem. Yeah. So, the, I mean, what matters is that it is solved. Yeah. Uh, even though, like, yeah, there, there are many ways to achieve uh, full reusability. Uh, what matters is that it is achieved. Yeah, 100%. Um, and then but once you're in the sort of over the hump of full reusability, whether one system is slightly better than the other is a secondary concern. Right, yeah, it's tomato tomato at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Should we uh, keep moving so, along here? Yeah. So when, uh, with flight three, when it, uh, when it broke up, that was mostly just because obviously it couldn't maintain orientation. So it didn't even have a chance uh, of having yeah. the heat shield. Uh, you would have noticed that the engines, there was a lot of like fire coming from the engines area, which is <laughs> uh, not, uh, you know that's not good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On re-entry. Right. Definitely <laughs> when not. When the engines aren't on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So this is, uh, you can see we're just finishing. We're, we're trying to get the uh, shell completed as quickly as possible, but we still have a lot of work to do on the interior of the factory. Um, but this will dramatically uh, improve the production of the rocket. Yeah. It's being able to move from one station to another, uh, which is a linear adjacent flow. Hmm. I don't, I mean, I assume, I don't really know what that means, but. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the, the thing that really matters for, you know, people talk about the moving production line of sort of Henry Ford and the automobiles. What, what actually matters is linear adjacent flow uh, as opposed to a production line that moves. Hmm. So, so the. So it's, it's simple. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like one thing leads, to, one, one step leads to another. Yeah. And it just, and things move along in a cadence. Okay. Yeah. Um, yep. And you don't have to have the physical. It doesn't matter whether there's a conveyor belt or not. Got it. That's got a it. secondary concern. That's the, yeah, got it. It doesn't matter. Um, it just matters that, that, that there's, a, there's a tempo. So yep. every station uh, has roughly the same amount of work time. Right. Um, and things move from one station to the next station and the specialization of labor at each station. Yes. Okay, so these are the principles that actually uh, matter. And that's what you guys kind of solve by doing the tents first, because you can just willy nilly rearrange things, see how things yeah. are actually falling, see what order things are going in. So the tents were very inefficient once you know what you want to build. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was the your five step thing of uh, don't get too far along in the automation before you. Yeah, you don't know what you're going to build. Yep. Um, like it's difficult to convey just how how much like you know this this is you know we don't even know what the rocket would look like. Yeah. Yeah. So. And in in some senses, you still. Don't necessarily know. It's still changing. At this point, we at this point we're confident of that this architecture will is is at least one of the solutions. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say there couldn't be other solutions like the one you talked about, um, but that th this will work. Yeah. Um, it's just a question of ironing out the bugs um, and improving the performance of everything from the engines to the avionics to the primary structure, the heat shield, everything. Yeah. Um, and. Um, that's, but it will work. Yeah. Um, I think I was mentioning, or I was beginning to say that the, the so the most important, the toughest remaining problem is a, um, a reusable orbital heat shield. Mm -hmm. So there's never, nobody has ever made a reusable orbital heat shield. So the space shuttle is closest, yeah. uh, but that took, I think something like nine months and thousands of people to refurbish. Right. So it's difficult to call, one can't, cannot call something that requires so much work to refurbish as right. truly re reusable, yeah. it's certainly not rapid. Yeah. Um, so um, for the first time ever, there needs to be a, a rapidly reusable orbital heat shield, mm -hmm. um, which no one has ever done, so it's a hard problem. Right. So that's why I'd say that's, that's the number one biggest remaining problem. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the goal of this flight and really the flights for the rest of this year is get through the high heating uh, mm -hmm. So the, the heat shield survives. Yep. Um, and um, and then and and the, the ship is still operational and is able to steer to a specific location yep. and do a landing burn. Yep. In the ocean. Yes. 
Um, and, uh, and then the, the booster, we wanted to be able to, for this flight, to come back and do a landing burn at a specific location. Yep. So, do we know how far out is that going to be? Do you know? Uh, it's pretty far out. I mean, we're, Are but, you, but, but I think we're pretty close to that. Um, if we don't solve it on this flight, I think we'll solve it in the, in the next uh, two or three flights. Uh, which, so just having this, the, the, the booster, uh, do the hot staging, come back, you know, do a boost back, um, steer, steer correctly um, and to a precise location and yeah. do a landing burn. And then and, and, and essentially do a, a simulated tower catch. So it's like... So will the tower actually... No, it's just a... Okay. It, 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 the, the rocket will think it's right. not trying to get caught by the tower. Right. At least I thought it'd first. be kind of cool if the tower mimicked it, you know, out here. To I make mean, sure, because I even wonder, like, how do we know the tower is going to be okay, you know, like after a launch like that, to be able to... Well, we, we can, we, we operate the tower after the launch, so we can tell if, yeah. if there's any damage. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if, if this launch goes perfectly, uh, we'll be able to, we'll, we'll have the, the, the booster, uh, le, um, do a boost back and a, a controlled, uh, aero, con aero controlled descent to a specific location. Yeah. Uh, initiate a landing burn and um, be caught by an imaginary tower. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the ship, uh, if things go perfectly, uh, which probably won't, um, it'll get through high heating. It will uh, uh, still be fully operational. It will control itself to a specific location um, and in the ocean and then um, initiate a landing burn and also pretend it's getting caught by the tower. Wow. Um, now I think it, it. I think we've got maybe a 50-50 chance of the heat shield working. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah. decent. Yeah, yeah, like it's a high, a high uncertainty, but like roughly 50-50. Um, but if not on this flight, it, then in the next uh, two or three flights, uh, I, I think we'll solve that. Yeah. Well, and you guys, let's let's kind of head over here. You guys did uh, make a decent amount of changes to hopefully ensure. Uh, re-entry is better this time. Like you added some new roll thrusters. Oh, yeah, yeah. And a few things well, like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. What what happened there that the roll thrusters got... Because they got clogged, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't tell me that was the uh, the old conversation we had of uh, hot gas thrusters and all that stuff. Or is it... Uh, um, which still... I, I'm still confused because... They, they, they got ice. Uh, we think ice in the in the valves. Okay, in the valves, not will, necessarily, or in the but, somewhere but, along the stream. They they got clogged by ice. We're not sure exactly how. Yeah. But but uh, if water ice will get into the the, the oxygen side, mm -hmm. um, there's a small amount. So, since we're um, the location that we're tapping off the engine um, is not is not pure O2, uh, it's got a little bit of a uh, water ice. <laughs> Why so is it have... It's 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 rich gas. It is ox. So is it coming off the actual? Yeah. Like exhaust or the turbine side? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So wouldn't it have? <laughs> wouldn't so it even have a little bit of? It's gas, but it's yeah. No, it's it's got burnt fuel. Yes. Wouldn't it have a little bit of CO two in it too? Then and can that turn little, into an little, ice? Yeah, can yeah. you freeze CO two at that temperature? Because I think. Yeah. Um, well. Anyway, it's it's it's. It's, it's got stuff that can turn solid at yeah. cryogenic temperatures, the thing that's re relevant. Right. So, uh, yeah, ice, whether it be water ice or, yeah, or CO2 ice or whatever. Ice. Ice, yeah. And it's, it's solid stuff that just, that blocks. <laughs> blocks things. Blocks things. Um, so we do, we, we, <laughs> we've improved the sort of uh, ice strainers or the ice catchers. Yeah. Uh, we've improved the valves. Um, and something I think we'll do in the future is move to, for, for critical valves, uh, serious parallel valves. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, any one valve failure does not, uh, no matter what happens, does not take out the ability of the ship to orient itself correctly. So are you avoiding doing like a more of a traditional heat exchanger, like a round raptor? You know, like, like I think Merlin probably does that, where it has a heat exchanger just to heat up, to be able to the provide all the helium, stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just curious. I've never heard of an engine using like uh, already combusted to be able to be the olage gas, you know, like off of the off the pre burner. That's pretty unusual, I think, at least. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, 
We have, we're, our rocket is autogenously pressurized, yep. so we're pressurizing the fuel side with gaseous fuel yep. and the oxide with mostly gaseous That's oxygen. Yep. Um, and um, yep. now in the case of autogenously pressurized, we have to create the gas. We're not merely uh, warming up a gas, we have to produce the gas. Oh, interesting. Is that how the shuttle did it too then? Because the shuttle ran on the RS-25s had autogenous pressurization. On the on the hydrogen side, yeah. I think that it, I, well, I guess I don't know if it's on both. Was it on both? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it was at least on, on the hydrogen side. Um, so, uh, maybe on both. Um, but when you, when you have uh, uh, autogenous pressurization, you've got to produce the gas, not just heat it up. Okay. So you, there's huh. a lot more mass you've got to come up with. Yeah, literally. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it actually affects our max power on the, especially on the fuel side. So the fuel pump uh, has to work, well, both pumps have to work harder, but the fuel pump especially is a limiting factor. Like if we turned off uh, autogenous pressurization on the fuel side, we'd actually be able to get more power out of the fuel pump. Oh yeah, because you're having to drive all that. Yeah, that you've got to, you've got to gas fly, yeah. You're, 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 you're bleeding mass flow right. uh, from the, you know. Um, from the engine. Yeah, from okay. the engine. Yeah. Um, you're, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of work in, in taking a cryogenic liquid mm -hmm. and heating it up to be a hot gas. Right. Um, so you got a phase transition and, and, and that big temperature delta. Yep. So it's actually a, a lot of uh, work to mm -hmm. produce the hot gas from a cryogenic liquid. That's crazy. So is that what also, do we, we, can we kind of step in here and see the all yeah. the boosters? This is crazy. Is that what also was the blockage of uh, the ox tank on the booster too then? Similar ice buildup blockage or was it on flight three, the Raptors were shutting down during boost back burn and had an ice buildup. Is it a similar thing to that? Oh, Sorry, it's hard to hear you. Yeah. Uh, is that what caused the, the booster to shut down on flight three with the ice ice buildup? Was it a similar type of thing? Like an autogenous pressurization issue that clogged um, a few of the engines? Yeah, we didn't have enough pressure to start the engines. Okay. So we were low, low pressure start. Um, the, the, the full answer is quite complicated, but uh, because arguably we could have started with, with lower pressure or we, we didn't need to start all the engines. Anyway, it's, uh, this, this time we expect to have a lot more pressure um, and we are able to start at lower pressure and we don't need to have all the engines fire. Okay, cool. Well, you know, hopefully. Yeah. So. Um, Jeez. This is crazy. Wow. Uh, the scale is just almost impossible to to imagine. And yeah, three and three boosters. Wow. That's just insane. <laughs> this looks so cool. Dang. A lot of engines. Yeah, it's an insane amount of engines. I mean, right here we're looking at what 99 yeah. <laughs> engines for these three 99 vehicles. Engines. 99, 99 engines and 99 a 99 Raptors on a wall. <laughs> 99 engines and a ship ain't one. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely insane. The scale of these things is just hard to hard to fathom. Wow. So um. Are you guys are trying to move down to three grid fins? Is that right from the from the four? Is that uh, it's Maybe. not a high priority. Uh, it's a it's a mass optimization to move. You, know, you definitely only need three. Yeah. And I think technically you could do it with two, um, huh. if you're willing to oscillate. Yeah. yeah like turn for yaw, then yeah. roll again for pitch. And yeah. That's definitely you know you're uh, asking for a bit of trouble <laughs> if you just have two grid fins. Right. Um, but it is technically possible. Right. Um, uh. The three three for sure. Um, but that's that's like a that's a fairly minor uh, op optimization, right? Uh, um, with the, the the cowbell diverter things, you know the the Olage gas thrusters or whatever. I need to clear something up for myself because I'm getting confused. So, cold gas thruster we'd say like would be like um, a nitrogen thruster, where it's just literally compressed nitrogen goes out of well, a cold nozzle. Cold gas is room temperature gas usually. Is, is room temp, and then. Are we, would we consider that almost like a warm gas thruster? Yeah, warm gas thruster. And then like a hot gas would be where it's a reaction probably, like a, bi yeah. a bipropellant thruster still. But for both the booster and the ship, you don't really need much uh, control. The attitude control 
uh, needed is, is small. Um, huh. So you just can't have a leaky valve um, right. or, or a stuck valve. valve. Yeah. That seems, I, I, this is like, like the Fal third Falcon time. Falcon is, uh, is all cold gas. What is? Fal Falcon oh, right. is all cold right. gas. Yeah, I mean, and we've done, I think, six starts. Uh, so it's, it's this cold gas that has been maintaining propellant settling um, and attitude control for, you know, 12 hours. Right. Yeah. So. And you have a lot of it on tap. So that's, I don't know why that's still a hard one for me to fathom. Uh, even though we've talked, this is the it's third got, time It's got now. a lot of hot gas. Yeah. Warm gas. Especially um, when it's empty. It's, it's all warm, warm yes. gas. But it's all, the delta, delta V needed is tiny. So it's yeah. a very tiny pressures are needed. Huh. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so how much do you feel like after you fly, how much is it like, oh God, we have to change all of these. Like, is it, is it literally you find something on one and then you're literally like in immediately having to make changes on all these things, like everything that's in production. Yeah. You're just so there's, there's hundreds of changes lessons. that actually take place, not a few. Yeah. Hundreds. If you go to a detail level, there might be thousands of changes that Especially happen. Especially when you get software involved, I'm sure it's... Uh, software, for sure. I'm just taking, talking hard, just hardware. If you just look wow. at the hardware changes um, <laughs> across the ship and the, the booster and the engines, it's thousands of changes between each flight. <laughs> but many of them are very small. But a very small change could be a big deal. Imagine how long it would take a traditional aerospace company that had a a rocket they're working on to make a thousand changes between flights and then fly it two months later. I mean, that's that's what we're doing here. This is yeah. barely over two months from the last flight and the vehicles had a, over a thousand changes. Easily over a thousand, several <laughs> thousand probably. Um, so, that's insane. Like well, I, I said, a bunch of them are little changes, but you say right. like, is it different in a way that could uh, have a, an effect on the rocket? Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably several thousand. And do you feel like for now, are you generally like kind of overbuilding them to just try to get through the point of being able to prove the heat shields, prove all the stuff, and then eventually yeah. you'll we're, work we're, on we're, mass? We're trying to answer the questions that I mentioned. The yeah. biggest question being, um, can, what does it take to get through max heating yep. uh, with a reusable heat shield? Um, then uh, being able to uh, have the booster come back and be caught by the, the tower. Yep and have the, the ship also come back and be caught by the tower. Yeah. So those are the three very big things big that questions. need to happen. And that's, in your mind, when you're launching these, including like flight one, two, three, you're, those are the questions, like those flights are just that's to what's answer needed for, those questions. For reusability. See, I think people just don't understand that that's, you're not looking at trying to get out there and, and launch a satellite tomorrow. You're no. trying the, to answer the payload, questions. The payload for all the flights this year is data. It's data. Just to learn things. Um, so it's, it's design refinement to understand what actually, what, what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. Um, you know, some things sometimes work, which right. can throw you off because it worked once, but it doesn't work again because of the combination of factors isn't the same. Yeah. So, uh, so you want to have, <laughs> so the, 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 the first things you'll find are like fundamental errors of design where mm -hmm. success was not one of the possible outcomes. Yep. Um, then in some cases it's kind of like Russian roulette. Success is sometimes poss possible, possible, right. yeah. Uh, but once in a while, you <laughs> you blow yourself up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that's going to require a lot of flights to, to figure Find out, like those. the the one in ten failure, the one in a hundred failure, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, there'll be a whole bunch of things like that. Well, kind of even like the SN stuff. When eight was darn close to landing, nine was almost a reversion feeling. Ten was better. Eleven was worse. Like there was a little bit of a ping pong as things were yeah. kind of being tried and tested and. You're still kind of in yeah. that phase, even even at this scale. I just don't think people are used to that, you know. Yeah, I mean, a, lo a lot of those like uh, early tests were, were were also just about us learning how to work with uh, stainless steel right. as the primary uh, primary structural element. Yeah, and uh, working with uh, liquid methane right. uh, and with a, a, a full flow stage combustion engine right. as the as the engine. So. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what people saw was that the, the, the flight, you know, did it land or not land, but we we're just trying to figure out how do we work with steel? Right. And how do we uh, work with a methane as a fuel? And a new engine uh, architecture. And a totally new engine architecture. And new flaps, like things that are just- Yeah, and do the flaps- New and novel. Yeah. You have to actuate yeah. the flaps. You need, you need very powerful actuators for the flaps because yeah. there are a lot of force. It's like an airplane moving its wings. Right, right. So these are- 
very powerful actuators that are needed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, and all of the, the, the like the, the engine to vehicle interactions are uh, very complicated. Yeah. So but you, you don't really see those on the test stand. When, you, when you're firing the engines on the test stand, you don't get the engine to vehicle interactions. And then you've got different right. engine to vehicle interactions in flight than you do on the ground. Yeah, oh, 100%. Especially yeah. when you're changing orientation of a vehicle yeah. and different G forces and like zero G, I mean, all the things. There's no test stand that can test uh, a, a rocket at 17,000 miles an hour doing six Gs right. uh, in you know every different orientation. Right, exactly. It's not, it's not possible. Yep. So you have to fly it. Yeah. You, you do as much as you can on the ground, then you've got to fly it. Um, Try to figure things out in simulation, but a lot of things are not going to be included in the simulation. So it'll work in some, but not in reality. Exactly. It's crazy. Uh, Shall we uh, keep moving? Yeah. <laughs> sure. see the Raptor is a lot cleaner than it used to be. It looks like there's less stuff, but yeah, um, already. Yeah. But these, these are still not like the, we're not to V3 here yet, right? No. Uh, is, is the V3 the same thing as like the lead engine? Is that, are those? Uh, sort of. The, the lead engine was, I think we will do that at some point, but that's like a, that's really a total tear up. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it looks like the lead engine, but it's way more expensive because it still has printed parts, yeah. uh, for example. Yeah. So, um, but the, yeah, the next gen Raptor engine needs no heat shield. Right. So, uh, and because it's exposed, it has to have cooling. So there's integral cooling circuits throughout the, all the parts. So it looks very simple on the outside, but it's complicated on the inside. Like even all throughout the, like the pre-burner and the, yeah. Gas manifolds and everything, it's it, all... It, all that stuff you see stuck on the side disappears. Wow. Uh, and that's actually, you, like that's being worked on now already? That's already... Yeah, we have a design. We have a design that's, that, that works. It, 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 it looks like the engine isn't complete. Well, yeah, you had that, that, that render on the, that presentation. It just yeah. looked like literally like a, a it looks first like attempt it's missing at marking parts. up. Yeah. yeah, but it's actually just the, the secondary circuits and integral cooling um, are part of each part. So, wow. so if you have a secondary cooling circuit, you run the secondary cooling circuit or, or secondary flow circuit uh, through the various parts. Right. Um, and we also eliminate a whole bunch of um, bolted and welded joints. Uh, wow. So especially the bolted joints, you really want to get rid of those. Yeah, yeah. You know, bolts and flanges and seals are hell, especially right, yeah. if they're hot. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the, the next gen Raptor engine is actually a little difficult to service because there are uh, parts that, are, that don't have a flange anymore, it's just welded shut. Right, right, right. Yeah. So you're just hoping to be able to get the design up to be so reliable, hopefully, that yeah. you just don't need to service it. If you need to change often. a part, you need to literally cut it open. Wow, so you'll probably, at this point, you might as well just like swap out the whole engine, I assume, and just... Yeah, well, no, we've cut it open. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it open. Um, so... Just crazy. But this, yeah. I mean, there's a massive, massive bolted flange for the hot gas manifold that's transferring hot gas from the fuel rich hot, hot gas from the fuel pump side. Yeah. You can see that. Um, it's... it's well, it's hard to point at because it's up in the air, but the thing that joins the the the, 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 the fuel off, yeah the fuel turbo pump to yep. the ox turbo pump yeah the kind of band looking thing yeah right? the yeah. band looking thing uh, that that uh, that has a a, mo a monster flange at the top and bottom mm. 
and you want to get rid of those two. And that's, that's a whole lot of pressure. Hot. <laughs> that's a whole lot of pressure. Hot pressure. Yes. Jeez. I mean, you can see there's a lot of flanges here. Yeah. I mean, this valve is like, oh, this, this pump is like made of flanges. Wow. Flange, 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 flange. And our, and like, I mean, these are beast, beast level flanges. Yeah. And these are all, uh, there's, so there is no like active cooling inside of two like this, or the current version of Raptor like this. There's no. Current version does not have, um, there's, there's no, there's no, well, there technically is some, but there's not, the current version of Raptor does not have sufficient cooling to be able to uh, resist um, being in the in hot gas plasma, like, like hot plasma. Yeah. It's not, uh, yeah, it would that's melt. That's why you need, that's still why I need this, the shield here. Yeah, then. that's why yeah. It's, it's heavily shielded. Um, but the next gen, a bunch of the flanges you see here will disappear and we'll have integral cooling and integral uh, secondary flow circuits. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you guys look, is it possible to do- There's um, a whole bunch of engines down there. Pretty densely packed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot of thrust. <laughs> it's a lot of thrust. That is crazy. It looks like a, when you go to a Christmas tree store or something. Just, yeah. That's insane. Uh, each one of these is the most advanced rocket engine ever made. And they're just being cranked out like it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Super high pressure, high efficiency. Is, full, you got a full flow st stage combustion. All the it's good. Insane. Yeah. Is, is there. Has there ever been any look into, like I know, you know, with uh, aircraft turbines, you can do, uh, you know, yeah. like some kind of cooling on the actual turbine blades. Is there any way to do any kind of cooling on the turbine blades and, and we've Raptor? Had, we've had that discussion many times. We probably head back into the, cool. and see the main factory. Um, I just can't believe how much has changed out here. You have two mega bays. I mean, last time I was out here, there is only one mega bay, and it, neither nothing had doors. Now you have doors. <laughs> That's a pretty good feature comfort. It's turning into a real factory, you know? It's, yeah. Well, this is a real factory that we're building here. Yeah. So, quite big. It's hard to keep up with everything out here. Yeah, so this is a... We'll finally have a real factory for Sasha. Not just making it intense. Um, yeah, so long term, we want to try to get the thrust of Raptor up to uh, around 330, maybe a little higher, maybe 335 uh, metric tons. So that'll take us to a 10,000 ton thrust at liftoff. That's um, absolutely absurd. Sorry? That's absurd. Yeah, yeah. It's like absurd. beyond absurd. That's coming up on three times the amount of power as the Saturn V. That's, yeah, that would be roughly three times the Saturn V. Um, yeah. But that's what you need. Like 22 million pounds of thrust, and Saturn V is seven and a half. Oh my God. So. Absolutely insane. Well, and I think, you know, there's this kind of feeling of why aren't, we, why aren't people doing things like, the, you know, the Saturn V being built in the, you know, <laughs> here in the 60s. Saturn V is primitive compared to Starship. Yes, and it's insanely expensive. It wasn't sustainable. Yeah. yeah, and it was it was expendable. So yeah, uh, Starship is in a. I, I mean, just a, a, any rocket that is fully reusable, which no one has achieved, because uh, it is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Not because they didn't think about think reusability. Do. Right, right. Uh, so it was just uh, too hard. So, and obviously we haven't achieved that either. Um, you know, we've, we've got a, I'm hopeful that we will achieve, achieve it by next year. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but at least, at least we have a situation where we have a design where success is one of the possible outcomes. Yeah. So no, no prior design uh, was success one of the possible outcomes for full reusability. Well, if you think about it, let's say you guys, for some reason, just were like, okay, screw it. We have to launch 300 metric tons to orbit. You could absolutely, you could you could expend a rocket if you had, like absolutely had to for some reason. Yeah, but it'd be pointless. It would be pointless. Uh, but like you have that capability. Like for the first time, 
Oh, since yeah. it's added yeah. five. Each. Well, I mean, generally, if you can do 200 tons uh, reusable, you can do double that um, expendable. Right, 400 tons. Yeah, yeah. Which is insane. Yeah. I mean, even to the point of if you had to do, let's say you had to do, you know, HLS or something to try to speed it up or something, to, you know, if orbital refueling's not done or something. No, orbital refueling, I mean, I don't want to count chickens before they hatch, but or orbital refueling is really just docking with ourselves. Yeah. We dock with the space station all the time. Right. A space station is way harder to dock with than ourselves. And But will it be all docking up to a, um, to like a depot? Is that kind of the plan? Is there to be at an orbital? It depends on how quickly you want to launch. So mm -hmm. if you're going to the moon, um, I don't know, I don't think you need a de uh, depot. I think you just send a ship up and send tankers immediately. Yeah. And your boil off rate will not be too bad. Okay. Um, so you, now for the moon, you'd want to have a dedicated uh, Earth orbit to moon system because mm -hmm. you don't need a heat shield. Right. Uh, well, I need a heat shield to break, I suppose. Um, well, pro probably actually, yeah. The moon is like hotter than it seems because it doesn't have an atmosphere. Right. Um, so you can't use the atmosphere to break. So. But if you have time, I, you I, can. I guess you probably have. But anyway, it's like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for landing on the moon, obviously, you don't need flaps, don't need a heat shield, uh, and you need very little thrust. Right. Uh, but you do need uh, pretty big uh, landing legs. Uh, right. So in case you. One leg lands on a boulder and one lands on a crater, uh, and you don't want to tip over. Right. So, because um, that's uh, you know, I think HLS. I don't think a lot of people understand that we're going from a 16-ton lunar lander with the Apollo program to a, you know, I mean, I don't even know how heavy HLS is going to be when it, when it lands. It's going to be at, you know, at least 10 times that massive, and or wait. Yeah, at least 10 times that massive, and acres of volume compared to anything that was landed during the Apollo program. And I just think that people aren't necessarily ready for how, how big Starship will be on the moon. It's basically a habitat when it's on the moon, you know? It's not just a little tiny tent like the Apollo lunar yeah. landers. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the, the next step is to go beyond Apollo and have a permanently occupied base on the moon. Yeah. Like moon base alpha. That's the next step. So you don't want to just have a few people there for a few hours. You want to have a permanently occupied base. Right. This factory is huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I guarantee if we came back in a year, it'd be just up and running like a normal factory already. I mean, it'll be, this will be full with equipment in three months. Jeez. So is there a decent amount of like new stuff that's, like is there hardware coming in here and tools that are coming in here that will unlock like, yeah. just mostly production rate or even like new ideas or, or what's that kind of like? I mean, you can build any given design in an artisanal way uh, slowly mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, by having a lot, a lot of crews come to the same station. But in order to have real production, you've got to move from one station to another where you have the same amount of work at each station. Right. So this is meant to have a lot of stations. <laughs> so you'll see a lot of work in progress. Yeah. And you'll be able to see very clearly, I guess, uh, wh where, the, where the blockages are. Mm -hmm. And make changes to it then. Yeah. Jeez. It's so funny to think about how, you know, we're only five years ago out here when uh, the Mark I and all you had was a tent and Stargate was the biggest thing out here, that little Stargate thing. Yeah. And now you, I almost missed it trying to pull into Stargate today because- yeah, It looks like a little hut. <laughs> yeah, it's like dwarfed by absolutely everything else out here already. Yeah. It's just crazy. Oh, that feels nice. <laughs> Air conditioning. Holy crap. It just keeps going. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was the main thing. Yeah. Jeez. So there was more behind that wall. Yeah. Holy crap. So this is more of a, a real factory here. This is what the other yeah, side will look like. The other side will look like this. You know, there we're, we're obviously just checking each tile to make sure it's uh, not cracked and it's well seated. How are you feeling about the, the way they're actually secured on there? Like the, the mounting point, is that decent? Uh, we're continuing to iterate on the mounting point. I, I mean, always... it's, it has a, 
you know, 99% of the time it works well. So it's just a question of figuring out what are the 1% that uh, have issues where it causes, causes a tile to crack or some yeah. other problem. I always keep thinking the, the one of the big challenges is that you can't access the, you can only access it, you can't access it from either side really. Like there's not a bolt you can screw on because you have- It's a snap-on. It has to be a snap-on. Yeah. Have you ever seen the like furniture mountings where like you have two pieces of wood joined together and then you spin a magnet on one end oh, and yeah. it spins the nut on? I've always wondered like if something like that could be I mean, this applied. is basically, it snaps on and you pretty much have to break the tile to pull it off. Really? Yeah. Uh, That's meant to go on and stay on. Yeah. Well, and we still see, like, even on the, the parts that aren't tapered up, you know, like on the main body, we still see some, some horizontal seams. What's the, uh, what's the deal with those seams? Uh, I know those, like, pretty bad. <laughs> uh, no, they, they don't really matter that much. Um, they're just different sections of the nose cone. So, uh, now, this is a somewhat of a debate. You could wait until the whole nose cone is made and then uh, and then put the attachment points on at that point. Mm -hmm. So currently we put the tile attachment points on in sections. Okay. So that's why you've got um, a line. The horizontal line, okay. Yeah. It's probably just a lot harder to, once it's all manufactured, it's just so massive, it'd be hard to put all the attachment points on. Is that kind of the problem? There are, there's more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> this is just a cat getting skinned. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not to say that, that there is, um, not a better way to do it. Yeah. Uh, there are. The first order of business is to get one way at all that works. Yep. Um, thereafter to optimize. Yep. <laughs> Watch your step here. I mean, there's still a lot of wow. work you gotta do here. Oh, that's cool looking. That's, is that the, uh, the landing tank for? Yeah, it's a header tank. Header tank there. That's insane. Jeez. And then are those COPVs propped up against it like that then? Is that what those? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Gotta pressurize the head attack with something and the engine's on on. Exactly. Wow. So the uh, like the Pez door that we see on Starship now is that? Do you think that's going to stick around, or is there uh, still going to yeah. be like a chomper someday, or is it? Uh, well, for the Starlink satellites, uh, they're pretty flat, so the chomper makes sense. There's no point in having a giant fairing for a, you know, flat little. It's a giant flat pancake. Right. What did the did the door test go reasonably well on the last one, or because I think you guys aren't doing anything. That's some it. issues. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty rudimentary, of course, I assume. Yeah. But it's wild that you've got this sort of really quite sophisticated factory on a sand on a sandbar by the Rio Grande. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an alien spaceship landed. Right. Seriously. So these are are these uh, thrusters here then? Yeah. Is that what these are? Little little jetpacks. I uh, just want to take the detailed stuff of the <laughs> that might uh, run afoul of some ITAR stuff. Deal. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if, if anyone is going to copy us. That would be, it's a hard thing to copy. <laughs> it's come a long way since three times. Yeah, it sure has. <laughs> I mean, everything's clean in this. There's no mud and dust. It's better when it has doors on it. I mean, everything used to have mud and dust. Yes. And birds and things. There's yes. always some finite mud and dust, but it's much smaller than... It's a long ways from... I mean... One <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Mark 1 thing, it looked like the junkyard in Tatooine. Which was charming. Yeah. You know? <laughs> there was a lot of dust and mud. Yeah. yeah. The far side rocket. The far side rocket. I mean, the Mark 1 was... Conceptual as a concept piece. Yeah, concept, was, I'd say con part concept part art. Part yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So James pointed out that the, this actually wraps all the way around. The like the, yeah. all of that's still back yeah. there. There's more to it. Yeah. 
That's, that's, the, wall that's the dome line. Jeez. Yeah, that's, that's the dome line. And the coils, that's the starter lines over there. That's crazy. Yeah, so we do have an existing factory that's wrapped around the one you just saw. Uh, so that's, that's where we make the, the, the ship and the booster. So then that will open up and it'll start yeah. serpentining it basically through there. Yeah, that, that will take down that wall there that is, um, once we have the doors mm -hmm. on the other side, uh, we'll take down that wall and then you'll just have factory will just kind of go as far as the eye can see. <laughs> it's so much bigger than I thought. From the road, it, I mean, it looks big from the road, but it's insane. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And then, obviously, the, the, the sections get gradually bigger as, the, as you go south. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why things start off sort of short and then get taller as you go along. <laughs> even, yeah, even the roof line does that, yeah. right? The roof's going to get bigger if the pieces get bigger. <laughs> that's absolutely crazy. Are you guys still using, like, I remember, you know, back in the day, there's a lot of, like, Tesla motors oh, being used. Actually, you said that so way. You out that way? Okay. So. Um, there's a lot of Tesla motors being used, like, you know, to, for the fins and all that kind of stuff. And maybe even the grid fins had, like, literally a Model S motor or something. Are you uh, still yeah. kind of using some Tesla parts like that? Yeah, we just use the Tesla uh, drive units uh, to actuate the grid fins. And, and the big flaps still, too, the, on the ship? Um, yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, to, yes. Uh, essentially, sorry. I was thinking about something else. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, 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 hey. <laughs> um, the uh, yeah. We use the. Uh, we're, we're trying not to use hydraulics. We're trying, it's all electric actuation. Yeah. So. The. Engines are also gimbaled electrically. Yep. So you're really moving away from hydraulics wherever possible, uh, really. Yeah, there's almost, I think there's actually no hydraulics in the vehicle. Uh, if there's hydraulics, some very tiny little part. Huh. But I think there's none. That's wild, actually. I can't even think yeah. of another. There's pneumatics. Right. A lot. For yeah. all the valves and everything, obviously. Yeah. That's crazy. Jeez. It's surreal compared to what it was yeah, it just was a surreal. little bit ago. Wow. <laughs> it just keeps going and going. That is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> From one little tent. Yeah. This is starting to make Hawthorne look tiny and Hawthorne's a, a big, well. Hawthorne's it, actually it, a whole campus. Cool. Absolutely crazy. That's Meme Street. Meme Street? Yeah. Is that, is that what it says now? That's what, that's what it's called. All right, I think we're jumping in a different car here. But if you look at the street <laughs> sign. We got Meme Street. Yeah, it's literally called Meme Street. <laughs> it's a, uh, that is its official name. It used to be called Weems, and we changed it from Weems to Memes. <laughs> <laughs> the important things, I love it. <laughs> Holy crap, was that incredible or what? Huge thank you to especially Elon Musk for showing us around and, and following up and, and just teaching us so much about uh, what's going on and, and showing us the inside. Uh, huge thanks. Amazing. And I also owe a huge thank you to our supporters, especially those over on Patreon. Uh, if you want to support the work we do here, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And now is a great time to be a supporter because we already have part two up for review. So again, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut to catch part two right now. But even if you're not a supporter, fear not. Part two is coming out once reviews are done. So be sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out. And while you're waiting, a good free way to support the channel is to just watch some recent videos that you might have missed, like other tours of companies or deep dives on alternate launch concepts. So click around, watch a few. It truly helps the channel out. And while you're online, be sure and check out our awesome merch store for shirts like this, our new Orbital shirt, and lots of other incredible things over at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks, everybody. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.